I only uh, just got back from England actually last week, so uh, hopefully I can uh, talk in a way you can understand me. Uh, I was going to share with you um, just at the start actually, I was at a library in Manchester and there was a statue as I went in that I took a photo of, which kind of perfectly summarised what I wanted today to be. Uh, the the uh, statue in the middle represents religion, and then the one on uh, our right is science, and the one on the left is art. And this was a, the library's way of saying that these three things need to all be together, uh, that they all relate to each other and they all play a role. And I particularly liked how the statue of religion was reaching down towards science and kind of ignoring the arts uh, right back. <laughs> um, also at this library, which was pretty amazing, uh, the lighting isn't great because they didn't really actually want photos taken, but this is the earliest known fragment of the New Testament in the world. This is a fragment of uh, the first chapter of John's Gospel, it dates from about 125 AD, they think. Um, that's pretty amazing to see uh, something that was written that close to the time of Christ. Well, I want to uh, sort of start by just thinking about the nature of the world and, and worldview, uh, how facts and purpose work. Um, Einstein, who was very famously an agnostic, uh, one of his more famous quotes, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. He knew, even as an agnostic, that you need both if you're going to fully understand what's going on in the world. The two things need to play off each other. Uh, science can tell you something about the how of the world and religion can tell you something about the why, but without both, you don't really get to see the full picture. Science can tell us how a kettle boils water, but it can't tell us why you might want to boil the water. You know, it, it can tell us something about the frequency and the speed and the wavelength of a series of musical notes, but it can't tell us whether it's a good piece of music, like many of our students. Uh, one example I kind of like is the idea of a kiss. Uh, there was a doctor in the 1800s who took it upon himself to define a kiss. Uh, Henry Gibbon said it was the anatomical juxtaposition of two orbicularis oris muscles in a state of contraction. That was his definition of a kiss. Uh, Dictionary.com has updated it slightly, uh, maybe got a bit more to the point, but you can't deny, they, they both are true. They both adequately describe a kiss. There's nothing wrong with those definitions. They are perfectly good descriptions, but they're kind of missing the point. Those definitions alone are not really going to tell anyone what a kiss is. I don't know, but I'm, I'm hoping Dr. Gibbons didn't go home to Mrs. Gibbons and say, darling, would you care to join me in an anatomical juxtaposition of our orbicularis oris muscles in a state of contraction? I don't think he would have got very far if he did, because you can tell people the facts, you can describe physical facts, you can talk about the how, but if you're not talking about the why as well, if you don't have the purpose behind the kiss, then you don't have the full picture. You know, you, you're not going to get a complete worldview without those two things, a description of physical facts and an understanding of purpose. And that's why we need science and religion integrated if we're going to fully worship God, because they tell two parts of the big picture and without one of them, that picture is incomplete. And we know as science educators that that's the case. We even have a biblical mandate for science education. We, we are called upon to educate uh, students if that's what we are given the gift for. I mean, the parable of the talents, you know, I, I've always loved the fact that they use the word talents, even though it was financial, it, it perfectly summarizes the situation. If we've been given a talent by God for science, if we've been equipped by God to uh, both explore science and especially to educate, to teach others, then to not use that is to bury our talent in the ground. And that did not end well for the first servant. Uh, Galileo uh, said something I have to believe too, and I'm pretty sure we all believe here, that it was God who gave us reason and intellect, and he didn't give it to us so we could ignore it. He gave those things to us so we could use them and to pass them on to the students that are in our care. Uh, if you don't have education, uh, if you're not educated about things, if we don't teach our students these things, it's very easy to fall prey to very plausible sounding arguments and not be able to see the flaw in them. 
not be able to see where someone is actually with an agenda trying to uh, pull the wool over our eyes uh, a little bit. Um, this is a, a pretty classic math trick uh, that I like to spring on my students from time to time and just let them deal with. You may know it, you may not. This is a, just an example of how you can make something sound very plausible. Uh, so the paradox is uh, three women order a pizza for $30. And uh, two of them have $10 bills, one of them has 10 $1 bills. Uh, and when the delivery guy shows up, they, they pay him the $30. But just as he's getting back in his car, he remembers, wait, they, they ordered before seven, so they should, have, they should have a $5 discount. So he, get, he knocks back on the door and he, he's got the money. So he gives them five of the $1 bills. Uh, of course, there's three of them, uh, five bills. So they keep one each and th think, well, you know, that was nice of him to do that. We'll tip him $2. And so they each paid $9 for their pizza. There's nine and nine and nine. The delivery guy got two, that makes 29, but originally it was $30. So where did the missing dollar go? And I'll give that to my students and I'll say, okay, you just work it out. Where's the missing dollar? You know, and they sit there and they, they analyze this and they try and think about the numbers and they try and work out, you know, have I added up wrong? Or, you know, have I missed something out? Or am I, I telling them something? And I, but I just sit there and wait for them to work it out. And some do and some never do. You know, and you eventually have to tell them. And like I say, I mean, you may know it. You may have been looking at it and work it out. But of course, the trick here is the $30 at the top is a complete illusion. Nothing ever did cost $30 in this trick. They thought it did, but actually the pizza cost $25. And so the real math is that they paid $9 each making 27, 25 of it went to the pizza, two dollars of it went to the delivery guy. There was no trick, there's, there's no paradox, there's nothing to not explain. But if you present it in the right way and you try and kind of slip it past them, they sit there believing this is a completely plausible paradox. They really think the dollar has just disappeared. And if you don't educate people. If, if we don't educate our students fully on science, we leave them prey to this kind of argument, something that sounds very, very plausible, that they can sit and look at and not see any problem in it, but yet the conclusion is a complete falsehood. And they're not going to be aware of it. They'll be completely fooled by it if we're not doing that. The only way you can be knowledgeable about a subject, the only way you're going to be able to correctly reason on a subject, is to be educated on it, to be informed on it, for us to take our students on a journey which puts them in a position where they can do that reasoning. Proverbs had something to say about that. Uh, Proverbs was uh, multiple times, that's just one verse, it was very clear in the, the benefit of, of learning and increasing in wisdom. So we need education, but who does the educating? That sort of becomes part of the problem we have here. I teach a course here called uh, Cosmology, Creation and Christianity. It basically is a course looking at the physics of the universe, the creation of the universe from a scientific perspective and from a biblical perspective. I love teaching the course, but one of the things I like to do in that course right at the start is give a questionnaire to the students. I give them a small questionnaire just to kind of find out where they're at. Uh, exactly what they believe theologically and scientifically. Uh, so I ask him a few questions just because I want to know where my class is when I start teaching them. And that has opened my eyes to the fact that just because a Christian says they're a student does not... Uh, let's try that again. Just because a student says they're a Christian, we should not assume that they believe or frankly even know the basic tenets of faith. I get some astonishing answers. I would not have believed uh, that people could believe some of these things about the nature of God and exactly, you know, what Jesus came to do for them uh, and also some of the, the science they believe as well. Uh, but one of the questions I like to ask that also disturbs me a lot when I look at the answers is, uh, who most influenced you in this belief? This science that you believe, who had the greatest role in that belief? You know, was it you yourself through research? Was it a parent? Was it a pastor? Was it a teacher? Was it a friend? 
Now, who played the biggest role in you forming that opinion? And almost across the board, with very, very few exceptions, the vast, vast majority say that they got most of their belief about science from a pastor. And that concerns me, and I think it should concern all of us as science educators, because frankly, it should be us who are doing that role. Right? Believing and trained scientists, we should be the ones who are most informing our students about the way science is, about the way the world is, and about how that relates to the Christian worldview. Right? But the, the problem is, I think at times, we just like to pass the book. There are hard, there are controversial, difficult topics out there, and it's easy to just ignore them or leave them to a pastor to explain. We don't want to step into that minefield and risk the wrath of Jimmy's mom or uh, William's pastor giving us a call and, and demanding what, to know what we're talking about. You know? And so sometimes we leave the education uh, to someone else. But frankly, that's not the way things should be. You know, we, we almost act like ignorance is a protection. If our students don't know about these controversial topics, then they're kind of safe. They're protected. Ignorance is never protection. Ignorance, the only thing ignorance is, is, is a vulnerability that you can guarantee Satan is going to exploit down the line. We're always hearing stories about students who go to uh, college or go into grad school or out into the world who get exposed to atheist propaganda, who get exposed to arguments like the math one that sound very, very plausible, that seem to say that science has disproved God and they're not educated enough to see where the mistake is. They can't look at the paradox and say, there's your problem. That's not a valid argument at all. They believe it. And they're robbed of that faith. We even hear tragic stories of you know, students who've read books like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and, and even committed suicide over it. And we're outraged. And we should be outraged. But frankly, we're, we're making, a lot of that is on us because we're not educating our students to deal with this kind of thing. We're not giving them a framework to say, this doesn't make any sense and here's what the problem is. Right? If we pass on the, the, the responsibility of educating our students over difficult topics in science and other subjects, then we're basically leaving them exposed and vulnerable. And we are badly failing in our mission. So however difficult it is, we are called on to do it. But how are we supposed to do it? I mean, it's not easy. We all know that. We will probably wouldn't be here if, if we found this easy. How are we supposed to do this in a world that basically likes to present science and Christianity as enemies of each other? All right. How are we supposed to do this in a scientific establishment that basically likes to equate faith with ignorance? If you're a believer, then you're stupid. Right? It doesn't make any sense for anyone to believe in God. And how are we supposed to do this in a church that often presents science as basically nothing more than a piece of propaganda to get rid of God? Right? Sometimes we act in the church like science is basically only there to disprove Christianity. That's its sole intent. Well, I would suggest that you know, these are difficult waters, but we can make life a bit easier by being on the lookout for two attitudes in particular. Two things that make this even worse than it actually needs to be. One from the church, one from science. And I would say as you go through um, you know, topics today and topics in the classroom, and as you learn and think about this, watch out for these two attitudes. Because if you can watch out for them, spot them, and kind of negotiate them as the propaganda that they are, life becomes a bit easier. It doesn't become a lot easier, but it becomes a bit easier. So firstly, the attitude of church towards science can often be that one that I talked about. That basically, uh, that science is simply out to disprove God. That's the only thing it really cares about. That, that science is just a, uh, a vehicle to remove God from uh, the world and to get faith, you know, something that is a relic of the past. Um, now, the reality is, a lot of us are here today because one topic in science dominates all others when it comes to this, which is evolution. I mean, we might as well put evolution at the forefront because for all the other topics, nothing dominates this paradigm like evolution does. You do a Google search on faith and science, you can guarantee that nearly every hit you're going to see is basically evolution. 
Uh, for right or wrong, I mean, there's plenty of other things, you know, cosmology and geology and lots of other things outside the world of science too. They all play a role, but evolution is the one. But sometimes we lose credibility on this with an attitude from the church. We have this attitude that basically science knows that evolution isn't true. That science has this idea that we know evolution's a lie, we know science just conspires to suppress all the evidence against it, but it doesn't care because evolution disproves God and so we move on. Right? Uh, you'll, you'll see arguments that basically try and say that simple math disproves evolution. Um, I was at a conference in May uh, and a guy presented a, an undergraduate, uh, well, the, the material from an undergraduate core math course. Uh, and basically the idea was here's some math of evolution and why it can't be true because basic statistics say that proteins can't form amino acids. Uh, and basic math says mutations will destroy information in a code. Honestly, please don't go along with this. The idea that math that a high school student could understand disproves a theory like that is not valid. It's a lot more complicated than that. You know, plus that's not the way science works. Let me ask you, name a famous scientist. Shout out some famous scientists. Newton. Newton. Pascal. Pascal. Jamie Proven. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dawkins. You know, uh, Einstein would be another one that would come up. People like Maxwell, you know, all of these people, the reason they're the answer, the reason they're famous is because they publish theories that turn science on its head. The reason why the most famous scientists in history are famous is because they did not basically just promote an established theory, they turn everything on its head. Science is about revolutionizing concepts. You know, if, you, if you're an average scientist who just wants to kind of get along, there may be a point to which yeah, you, you just kind of toe the line and you go along with the establishment. But frankly, people who dream of being incredibly famous scientists, they dream of disproving big theories. Right? If, if evolution had been easily disproved by math, you would know the name of the person who did it because they would be just as famous as these people along with their new theory. Right? But we act like Biologists all know this is a lie, but they just go along with it. I guarantee you every aspiring famous biologist dreams of disproving evolution. They will give anything to disprove evolution because they would take their place in the highest echelons of scientific history. And it may yet happen. It took 300 years before Einstein showed that Newton's laws weren't true. But equally, Newton's laws are pretty close to the reality. Um, the idea that science is in this big conspiracy to suppress something that it, it, it knows isn't true doesn't do the church any good in terms of credibility, right? That's something that muddies the waters and allows science to portray us as ignorant, all right? That's not to say that evolution necessarily is true, but the, the, uh, the, the idea that it's a very simple process to disprove it, please don't go along with that. That's, that's simply not the case. Um, you know, my, my personal opinion, uh, we're, we're going to talk later, we have the panel discussion and, and we have a whole spectrum of opinions in, in CSU. Uh, you know, there are people who are ardently against evolution and people who are ardently for it and are right across the spectrum. Uh, and, and it's good because we all learn from each other. You know, I, I think by and large, I think evolution probably is the way it is. I, have, I suspect that there are flaws in, in the argument. I think there's certain areas that are very flawed areas like evolutionary psychology just seems nonsense to me uh, but I think it may be the way it is but I don't know I'm right I know plenty of people who disagree with me and I think you know th there's a possibility there right we all have to have a kind of an attitude of, of humility that we might not necessarily be right in what we are but I certainly don't think that it can be disproved as easily as the church might suggest it can be but then science also has this I did that talked about the idea that everyone who's a believer is stupid and if you want to quote on science then Dawkins is always your guy to go to he's very reliable he's just two of hundreds I could have chosen right. I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world faith is the great cop-out the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence faith is belief in spite of even perhaps because of the lack of evidence right rubbish 
Absolute nonsense. That everyone here knows that. Everyone here came to faith because of some kind of evidence. Everyone at the point of salvation made a rational, reasoned decision to weigh the evidence. Was Jesus Christ the Son of God? Did he come to earth to die for my sins? Did he die on the cross? Was he raised again? We all sat down and thought about and decided, yes, the evidence tells me, yes, he did. But the blind faith is a complete myth that is promoted by the scientific establishment. There is no such thing as blind faith, it's just nonsense. Every Christian at the moment of salvation makes a decision based on evidence. Right? We all value evidence. We all look at the, the clues in front of us and make a call on it. Even Thomas <laughs> demanded to see the holes in Jesus' side before he would believe the resurrection. Even Thomas wanted hard evidence in front of him before he would make his decision. The, the, the atheist side of the scientific establishment would love to promote the idea that that's how Christians are. And yet even scripture says that's not how things are. God commands us to reason and to reason with him. But all these famous scientists we were talking about, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Leonardo da Vinci, Blaise Pascal, they all had access to the exact same philosophy Dawkins did, and they all believed in God. They all accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. These are some of the cleverest people in history. The idea that being a Christian equals being ignorant and not being interested in the sciences, is just a complete lie that's put out by the scientific establishment. And we need to expose that for the lie that it is. But if we try to shy away from controversial topics, if we say, well, let's not teach our students about these topics, frankly, we're playing into this. We're playing into their hands right here. You know, this is what atheists wish Christians believed. They desperately would like the Christian attitude towards science to be those quotes. Because then basically God becomes an answer to all the things we don't understand what's known as a God of the gaps. God becomes defined as every gap in our knowledge. Anything we don't know, anything we don't have an explanation for, the answer is God. Why does it rain? Because God pours water from the sky. What's a rain Why is there a rainbow there? Because God drew it there. You know, what they want is for Christians to not seek natural explanations for everything, to not value science, but to simply answer God for anything they don't know. And they desperately wish that because that is the only kind of God that science can disprove. That's the God that is under threat from science. Unfortunately, it's no God that's recognized by the Bible. But that's what they would love because that way, every, every time science comes up with an explanation for something, they've just chipped away at God. Once science can explain what a rainbow is in terms of light diffraction, well, you've just lost a bit of God. And eventually science can chip away until there's nothing left. And so that's what atheists would love Christians to believe. That's why they promote this, because they can then say, yes, science disproves God. And if, it, if God was a God of the gaps, they'd be absolutely right. And we need to stand firm and say, this is not true. Faith is not belief despite or even because of the lack of evidence, faith is all about evidence. And the scientific world, seen through the eyes of faith, is just a big part of that. But we do need to be careful. You know, that's part of our responsibility as scientists and science educators. We, we are called on by scripture. There's a biblical mandate. We go to nature for explanations before we go to God. Because going straight to God for explanations of things we don't understand is basically presenting a God of the gaps to people. And that's something that we absolutely need to guard against. So we should be raising science up in the church. We should be saying science is a fundamental part of our worldview and of our calling uh, as Christians. Because it's the way that we actually portray God as the person he actually is. Not the person that uh, atheism would have us believe. So I've, I've talked a lot about why we need to do this and, and science. So let's just look at right, what is science? We keep talking about science. All right, what is it? Well, the first thing to say is science is absolutely no threat to the Christian faith. Right? That's the first thing to say because science is just about exploration of nature. 
All science is, is an analysis and a collection of facts and observations of what we see around us. The only thing science can find is truth. And uh, as Thomas Aquinas said, all truth is God's truth. All science is doing is just finding out more and more about God's creation and therefore God himself. Uh, even, you know, dictionary.com, science is the systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. It says nothing about theory. There's nothing there about theory. It's simply look at what's around you, make a note of it. That's science. But we all know as scientists, that's, that alone is not going to do a whole lot without the scientific method. And so we observe, we do the analysis, we look at what's around us, but then we form a hypothesis to explain it. And then that hypothesis gives us predictions, and so we run tests, and we say, well, did it, did that, were our predictions met? Yes or no, and we proceed from there. And of course, it's this hypothesis part here. right? This is where we need to be aware. This is where we step from science into philosophy, effectively, or at least conjecture. Right? This is the line where we need to be aware that something is happening. Because right? there are facts and there are interpretations. Right? And, and we need both. You can't do science properly if you don't have both because we're not going to kind of use the, the facts and observations that we, we get in any practical way if we don't then proceed along the scientific method, but with the understanding that we are stepping into a more human and therefore sinful arena. Right? Something that is, is open to flaw. Right? We have science, we have the scientific theory, and a good scientist is going to be very honest about where the line is. A good scientist is going to say, here are the facts, and here is a possible interpretation of the facts. Here's a possible explanation. Right? Some explanations have more credibility than others because they keep giving pred predictions that come true, or there's less so, but they're still all about interpretations. All right? And... You know, we need to be on the lookout for a person, someone who's skilled in deception can blur that line. It's hard enough to see the line at the best of times. But someone who's skilled can blur that line so much you won't even know it's there. They can make it look like you're still talking about facts when actually you're talking about their theory. And if you're not paying attention, or if we don't educate our students, they won't be aware that this line has been crossed. And frankly, the same thing happens on, on the... Uh, theology side as well. I mean, we have the facts of scripture and we have the interpretation of theology. But again, you know, we should be very honest about where the line is, right? We have the, the, the inerrant words of scripture, but as soon as you move into our interpretations, as soon as man comes involved, our sinful nature means we, we could well be wrong. We quite likely will be wrong in some way or another. We usually manage to mess things up a, a lot in that way. So on the one side, you've got facts and theory, and you've got people trying to blur the line. They're trying to fool people into thinking that the theory is actually just as like, unequivocal as the facts. And then right on the other side, over here, sadly, there are dishonest people in the church, uh, or, or maybe people with good intentions who are just misguided, who are basically blurring the line from scripture to theology and saying, presenting their interpretations as if they are just as inerrant as the words of Scripture. And it's not really surprising when you've got all this going on that we, we seem to be looking out at a minefield when we look at science education. When we're looking at what to tell our students and what's safe and what's okay and what we should say and what we shouldn't say, it's no wonder this looks chaotic because we've got all people on all different sides of the spectrum who seem to be out with personal agendas trying to make this even more complicated than it needs to be. But if you're on the lookout for the, the attitudes that I talked about earlier, you can strip away some of that. And we need to be honest with our students as well. We need to make sure that we don't try and present our interpretations as fact instead of conjecture, both on the scientific and the theology side. Because I think it's a lot of this that makes people think that science has this war on God. If we can strip this away, we can ask, is this real? Is there a war on God? Does science actually kind of have it in for God? Well, we're often presented with this from the atheistic establishment. 
right? There's this sort of basic syllogism they like to put forward. Science is true, science disproves God, therefore there is no God. Right? That's basically what's pushed on people from the atheism side of things. All right? And again, this is a little nebulous, so let's, let's make it evolution. Let's, let's nail it on down to, to evolution because that's probably what's pushed the most. And, and it needs to be said, this isn't science. This argument is not science. It's not even scientific method. This is pure philosophy. It's, it's, it's nothing more than a, a philosophical approach. But that said, there's no arguing with the logic. I mean, that, that's a, an incredibly basic logical process that can't be argued with. If this is true and this is true, then this is true. There's certainly no thing with the logic. So there's only really three options here. There's only three things that could be the case. One is this is all true. That, that this actually is a proof that there is no God, in which case we might as well all go home now, close down CSU, stop giving money to charity in the church, start living for yourselves because that's it. But clearly none of us believe that. Clearly we don't think that's the case. So there has to be a flaw in one of the premises. Either this isn't true or this isn't true. And the, one of the big problems is the church seems to be pretty much divided right down the middle as to exactly where the problem is. This is one of the confusing things, and that's what makes this such a, a worrying arena to step into as science educators. One of the reasons we're so hesitant to get involved in all this thing. Because half the church is basically saying this is the flaw in the problem. Right? Broadly speaking, most, for the most part, the evangelical church is saying that's not true. Evolution is not true. Evolution is not the, the way things are, and so there's the flaw in the problem. But then on the other side, the, the mainline Protestant and Catholic churches, by and large, are saying, this one's the problem. Evolution doesn't disprove God. That's not a valid argument, because premise number two is flawed. And there's no really sort of coherent agreement in the church as to, everyone agrees that there's a flaw there, but not everyone agrees where the flaw is. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want this to go on and on for time purposes. I had a, a load of quotes from different, different Christians on evolution that basically just kind of shows the spectrum of belief that people have towards it. Uh, there's the Pope being very uh, pro-evolution. Uh, there's BibleInfo.com saying, no, you can't believe in evolution and be a Christian. The two things are mutually incompatible. Uh, there's John Polkinghorne, a very famous uh, Anglican theologian who's kind of just presupposing evolution to be true. Uh, creationworldview.org is kind of using uh, uh, science as, as its kind of foundation for disputing premise number one, that evolution is not true. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza will probably be a, a rarer example from the evangelical side of someone who's just kind of taken evolution as a fact. Uh, Usually you can rely on C.S. Lewis for a great quote. He just confuses everyone by kind of saying, well, it's half of one and half of the other. It's a bit right, but it's not all right. So that didn't really help very much. So basically you've got this whole spectrum of opinion. But as I say, within the church, it does by and large split down the middle. It does generally fall that most of the Catholic and mainline Protestant churches would broadly accept evolution and say premise number two is your problem. Right? Evolution does not disprove God at all. Uh, and you often hear from that side this kind of attitude promoted that people, Christians who do reject evolution, they're stupid. Right? They're, they're anti-science, they're stupid, they, they're not doing a good job scientifically. And then on the other side, by and large, for the most part, the evangelical churches, they're broadly rejecting evolution and saying premise number one is your problem. Evolution isn't true. And, and what you often hear from that side is Christians who accept, well, people who accept evolution can't be Christians. They're not true Christians, or at the very least, they're on a very slippery slope to apostasy. Uh, those are two things we hear a lot in the church. And frankly, I've, I've been interested in this for a long time. I've done a lot of reading, a lot of talking. I talked to my colleagues across the department and elsewhere. I've been doing it long enough to know that neither of these things is true. I know far too many intelligent, uh, very good scientists who are Christians and reject evolution to believe that rejecting evolution equals ignorance. 
I'd have known far too many spirit-filled and Christ-like Christians who accept evolution to believe that they're not Christians or that they're on a slippery slope. Both of these, please don't go along with either of these two things. Both of these are not true. I can tell, that's one thing I do know. There's a lot of things I don't know and I'm uncertain about, but that's one thing I am very certain about from my experience is that both of those attitudes are to be rejected, right? Neither of those things are things that we should be promoting and they're not helping. They're not helping us as science educators deal with this arena. We have got to stop using our energies fighting each other in the church. Right? We don't have to all believe the same thing about things like evolution, but we do have to stop ignoring the countless lost out there while we face each other and, and dispute tiny little pieces of science. Ignoring the fact that there's 99% of stuff we completely agree on, we all share the same goal, we all share the same passion for Jesus, and yet we let ourselves get bogged down in this tiny little area and we're ignoring people out there who are crying out for an understanding of life, an understanding of purpose. They're crying out to hear the gospel and we're too busy fighting ourselves about science, which is ridiculous. So one thing we need to do is that, and we can help that as science educators. If we educate our students about what, the, what is going on in the world, what they will face and the different things that they'll hear about, then we can equip them to realize that this is not the way that our energy should be being spent at all. Not only that, we're missing the key point here anyway. <laughs> Even if, regardless of where the flaw is, that actually, the real problem in that argument is premise number two. There is something that we can kind of come together and agree because evolution definitely alone does not disprove God. There is a glaring hole in the argument, which is that the idea that evolution explains life. And it doesn't. It simply doesn't. Even Darwin was honest about that. Evolution is a mechanism to explain a developing complexity within a life that already exists, but it cannot explain where life came from. So we let atheists say evolution does away with the need for God. You don't need God anymore, which is a complete falsehood, and yet we're too busy arguing to say, everybody, this isn't true. There's a huge glaring hole in the argument. Now, I said before, I think by and large evolution probably is true, but I know plenty of other people who don't, and I, I, I'm by no means certain that I'm right. You know, my colleagues here, Andy Blauk over there, who's, who's talking later, I mean, Andy and I are on totally different sides of the spectrum. I know that Andy is very much a young earth creationist. He knows I'm very much a the, theistic evolutionist, but we've known each other for seven, eight years. We've never once argued. We like to sit down and talk about it because I learn from him and uh, with a bit of luck, he learns a tiny bit from me. And, and we, we find out an awful lot more about what's going on by simply discussing, but knowing that underneath it all, we have exactly the same passions, the exact same love for Jesus and the exact same desire to share the gospel with each other. So I, I, I don't know <laughs> whether it's true or not, but I do know one thing, one thing I'm certain about if it's true, just let's say if it's true, then God's fingerprints are all over it because everything that God did, he wrote his signature onto. Just there waiting to be found if we just look for it. Right? That's one thing I do know. If it's not true, then there'll be something else out there with God's fingerprints on it instead. But God doesn't hide from what he did. God's creation has his fingerprints all over it. And that's one thing I do know, which means that there is something we can do here. There is a way forward because it kind of, now, it, it doesn't really matter the situation. There are some things there's no point trying to do. There's no point trying to reconcile these two things. Like I say, we can just acknowledge that people have different beliefs in the church and that's fine, that's okay. There's no point trying to make them into one thing, nor is there any point trying to unite behind one. There's no point me saying, everyone who believes in evolution, stop it. Believe again, don't believe that evolution isn't true. That's not gonna work. Nor can I say, everyone who rejects evolution, stop. Now you believe in evolution. Okay, let's go. That, that, that's never going to fly. There's no point trying to demand we unite behind one. But as I say, we can recognize that it's a very minor thing. Right? And the, the thing that often causes us so much hesitancy in science education, the thing that worries us so much about going forward is so minor. And we also could have the humility 
to know that our interpretation is wrong. We're not very good in the church at acknowledging that just because we have interpreted something one way, it could be wrong. We like to think that our interpretation is just as inerrant as the scripture we're interpreting. Uh, and frankly, history has taught us else <laughs> otherwise, right? There's plenty of lessons from history. If we go back to the Enlightenment, um, there were differing opinions in science and, and the church. Science thought that the universe was infinitely large and infinitely old. It had been around forever, it was eternal, it was never created, it just has always been there and it will always be there. And the church says, no, the, church, the universe was created. God created it and it has a finite age. Even back then, long before geology, long before evolution, the church disagreed on how old the earth and the universe were. There were still differing opinions, but that everyone agreed that there was a finite age. And of course, we now know that the church was right and science was wrong, right? Science has had to change its interpretation, uh, change its philosophy and acknowledge, yes, indeed, the universe does have a finite age. That is the current model. I'll be looking more about the cosmology in my breakout session later. I'll be looking at the Big Bang. Uh, that's a shameless plug for my breakout session later. <laughs> uh, but there was a, a difference of opinion and it turned out that Science was wrong, the church was right. But what triggered the enlightenment was basically Galileo saying the earth orbits the sun and the church saying, nope, we've got verses in the Bible that tell us unequivocally that God laid the earth on its foundations, it will never be moved. There's no other way of interpreting that, so you're wrong. The, everything orbits the earth. And of course, now we know that in this case, science was right and that interpretation of scripture was wrong. No one still believes that everything orbits the earth we all know that that was actually an incorrect interpretation of scripture the words were inerrant the interpretation was wrong so we've seen that before not just in science in in all areas uh, of education even within the church we've seen in, we know that what seem to be easy clear interpretations are not so clear you know i could fill this screen with verses that say your salvation was predestined I have filled this with verses that unequivocally seem to say without any shadow of a doubt that everyone is predestined to either be saved or not saved and that Calvin was right. And then I could immediately replace it with 10 verses that say, no, it's very, very clear that you get to choose your salvation. You know, the, you, you can say with Job, as for me and my family, I choose the Lord. All right? And they all seem just as clear. And so Arminius was right. And basically what we need to do is just have humility to say, what we might think of as a very clear interpretation that has no other way of in being interpreted, both scientifically, but also scripturally, we might be wrong, right? We might have called it wrong. It's, it's perfectly okay to have our opinion, but we need to have some humility in that as well, because a lack of humility is always going to complicate this arena as well. So I say, I think we can reach point of agreement on this. I think uh, we can actually come together and reach a point where we can be that bit more confident in establishing. I realize I haven't really said anything about how to do faith integration. I hope you don't mind. Basically all the breakout sessions later are gonna do that. What I want here is to say why it's important and how we can go ahead in it when sometimes it seems a, it, it's something that really intimidates us at times, right? How are we supposed to, to do this? But there's basically two possibilities. Right? Again, coming back to evolution, two things, one, one thing is true out of two. Either evolution is true or evolution is false. Right? One of those two things is true. Which one? I don't know. We'll, we'll all have our beliefs. We all could be right or wrong. But one thing I do know is that if evolution is to be further established, then we need elite believing scientists to explore that. They're going to be the ones that show God's fingerprints. If it is the way that God created, uh, the way that God um, used a mechanism to, to bring about uh, mankind, then we will find that. And we ne but we need students to be trained on that. They need to be educated. On the other hand, evolution can be false, in which case we still need elite believing scientists out there to do the job, right? Regardless of which one is true, we're gonna achieve nothing if we don't educate our students on controversial topics. If we said we don't want to talk about evolution in the classroom because we might get an uncomfortable phone call, then all we're doing is sending out students without any capacity to play a role in 
the future of science and completely vulnerable to all this propaganda they're going to hear when they get to college, when they get to graduate school, when they get in the workplace. They're going to hear people say evolution disproves God and they'll say, well, I don't know what evolution is, but that certainly sounds a very plausible argument to me. We are doing our students no favors. We are completely failing if we don't educate them about what they're going to hear and educate them about how to deal with that. All right? Whatever the case may be, it's true in all science. It is very wrong of us. It is morally and theologically wrong if we just step away from this and leave this education to, to theologians, to pastors, to people who we feel are, are more capable of dealing with it. Right? That is not what we are called on to do. So what I would like to do is just to finish by encouraging you to teach, to teach with passion, because when we teach and when we learn, we are learning more about God. Everything we learn is more about God's creation, therefore more about God himself. So it's worship. Learning science and educating science is worship. We don't have to find time to worship around those jobs. That job is worship. And so we should go with passion. We should teach with humility that we don't know everything, that we're still learning, and be honest with our students that we're still learning with them, but opening their minds to, that they can be humble as well and realize the situation. But most of all, I hope that you leave today inspired to teach with confidence that every time you learn, you are learning facts Every time you do science, you are learning facts. You are learning about the world around you. You are learning about truth, and God is truth. So we should go forward confident. We don't need to fear any topic, because no topic, no subject is a threat to God. Everything that we learn, we are learning about what God did. We're just learning one part of God's creation. And so we should have total confidence and total passion about our teaching because we are learning ourselves about God and we are helping our students learn and worship God. And I hope that when you leave today, you have that uh, inspiration to go forward and do it and not worry about that. And I thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people. I hope you enjoy the breakout sessions. Uh, and if you've got any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them later. Thank you.